Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Wallace Collection Online and our lecture this evening, Masters of the Spanish Golden Age, Velasquez, Cano and Murillo by uh, our director, Dr. Xavier Bray. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Xavier. Uh, thank you very much and a very, very good welcome and a good evening and welcome to at the Boris Collection. I am actually at the Boris Collection, although my screensaver happens to be the Great Gallery. Um, I am here, so I'm talking to you live from the Boris Collection, Manchester Square, London, and thank you for all of you who have joined uh, this lecture tonight from, I hope, the whole, uh, the world uh, out there, and particularly uh, here in England, we're still in lockdown, although I have the pleasure to let you know that literally about an hour ago, um, we, we've been able to um, uh, make the decision that we can reopen the Wallace Collection on the 3rd of December. So I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you all uh, to the Wallace um, next Thursday. Uh, but tonight um, is going to be a, a, an, an opportunity, really, for me to tell you about the Spanish paintings at the Wallace Collection. Um, it has to be said that uh, lockdown, uh, I thought lockdown was going to be a great moment to do all my special articles and finish off all kinds of essays. It hasn't. Uh, there's been a lot of work just to try to make the place uh, survive and get through these very challenge challenging times. But I will admit that the last few weeks I have been able to walk around the galleries and really get to, um, to know the collection in different ways. And I felt that maybe it was time to, um, to explore the Spanish paintings in more detail. And it has been an absolutely fascinating experience uh, to the extent that I've made a few little discoveries, which I will share with you. Um, but also it just makes me realize, and I hope you this evening, that the Wallace has got one of the greatest collections of Spanish art um, in, in the world. And of course, you will all know the Wallace, particularly on a beautiful spring day in Manchester Square. Um, the front facade, the, the home of Richard Wallace and Lady Wallace. Um, you will, of course, uh, be familiar with the wonderful staircase that uh, Richard Wallace acquired from the Royal Bank of Paris um, and brought over uh, to install in his home. Uh, you will know the Great Gallery, which comprises some of the great paintings of the European school. Um, and the founders, the fourth Marquis of Hartford, who is on the left here, and his uh, illegitimate son, Richard Wallace, uh, together, um, brought together brought together a most extraordinary collection of, of arms and armor, sculpture, uh, porcelain, uh, paintings. They um, resided in Rue Lafitte in Paris. Uh, they had so much art that they had to uh, store it at one point. Um, but it was in 1870 when Richard Wallace inherited uh, the title, uh, the, the title of the collection, that he uh, was able to bring it to London and display it here at, at the Wallace, at the at Hartford House. Um, he, with his father, uh, had been particularly uh, engaged in collecting French uh, decorative arts and French paintings. They even acquired uh, Bagatelle, a beautiful uh, sort of residence in the outskirts of Paris, um, an 18th century um, marvelous piece of architecture full of wonderful interiors and it still exists and is very much open to the public. It's uh, the Ville de Paris who runs it. Um, but they really, really focus most of their time on French paintings, the decorative arts, porcelain and, and, and such but beautiful pieces, which was of course very fashionable at the time. And so you were, and, and among the paintings they collected was of course the famous Swing by Fragonard uh, the Franz Haus Laughing Cavalier, the two icons here. Um, but when it came to going to the auction houses and bidding for the more sort of uh, macabre, or more religious and Catholic images of saints praying and in meditation, um, it has to be said that the fourth Marquis and Richard Wallace uh, took a step back and decided that it wasn't the kind of art uh, for them. This great masterpiece by Serberan, of a Franciscan monk uh, meditating in total darkness uh, was acquired by the National Gallery in 1853, a great acquisition, but which was criticized by the press for being a dark, repulsive thing. Uh, the, the, the general public did not understand these great works of art at the time. And it has to be said that Richard Wallace and the Fourth Marquis uh, also did not share the same uh, sort of passion for this kind of Catholic art, and nor were they attracted 
to Ribera's <laughs> images of, of saints being tortured alive. Here, he, here is St. Bartholomew being skinned alive. No, rather, the fourth Marquis, and he says to his agent dealer, you know, he prefers pleasing pictures. And indeed, the pictures that he particularly loved were those by the Spanish civilian artist Murillo. And here are the uh, Murillos that he acquired. Now, of course, uh, today's scholarship rejects some of these. They are studio works or copies, but we do have uh, amongst the 13 Murillos he acquired, a very good uh, selection of eight fully autographed Murillos, which I'll be talking to you about this evening. Um, but it just gives you an idea that um, the fourth Marquis was very much following the passion for Murillo that really began uh, from the late 17th century, even in Murillo's own lifetime in, in both Britain and, and, the, and the Low Countries, and especially throughout the 18th century and the 19th century. And here uh, I show you uh, Murillo's wonderful self-portrait from the National Gallery, but with a quote from uh, Noel Desenfants, uh, the co-founder of Dulwich Picture Gallery, who, who, you know, on behalf of all the collectors said, you know, Murillo was the, the favorite of all of them. Um, and indeed, um, when you look at uh, particularly two pictures that we have here, the Wallace, uh, a virgin and child, there's something very uh, sweet, very sensitive in his depiction of, in this case, the virgin and child. You can tell that he's um, managed to get a, a, a young girl to pose for him with a child. He's slightly idealized, but there is still this sort of naturalistic quality to them. These could be two uh, figures you would see in, in contemporary life. And when you zoom in, I mean, there is something extremely humane about his depiction um, uh, th that we see before us, particularly the way they look at you in the eye. Um, and this is a picture that hangs high here at the Wallace, which I would love uh, to bring down. I have to say the opportunity to look at the pictures here has also made me think of how we could better exhibit them uh, perhaps in future. The other picture that we have is this oval painting of the Virgin Child again, um, but which goes very well with uh, Ruskin's quote. Um, Ruskin did not particularly like Murillo's paintings of, of street children, of urchins. He didn't like the dirty feet. Um, and he's well known for criticizing the paintings that are now in Dulwich Picture Gallery that show a street virgin. But when it came to these beautiful images of, of the virgin, he came up with this very sensitive quote. Uh, true, it is true that his virgins are never such goddess mothers as those of Correggio or Raphael, but they are never vulgar, they are mortal, and that's key. Uh, but to, um, into their mortal features is cast such a light of holy loveliness and such a beauty of sweet soul. So you can tell that, uh, that in a way, Ruskin reflected not only a British taste for Murillo, but is for certain the fourth Marquis's uh, taste for these very delicate and pleasing pictures. Now, how did Murillo become famous now, he was collected by certain British collectors in the 18th century, there's no doubt about that, to the extent that the Spanish authorities had to um, put a special export license for any Murillos leaving the country. But when it came to the Peninsula War, when Napoleon sent his troops into Spain, and when the Maréchal Soult uh, took the opportunity to loot uh, paintings, he was specifically interested in Murillo. And indeed, uh, he, uh, when he arrived in Seville in, in, in around 1810, he plundered the monasteries, the convents, the churches, and, and took many of those pictures with him uh, back to Paris. Um, indeed, when his sale came up of his own collection, his private collection in 1852, uh, the press were right on it. Uh, and here on the right, you can see uh, an article with uh, two of the most famous pictures. The one on the top is the, sorry, the um, Sult, um, known as the Sult Immaculate Conception, which is now in the Prado, uh, but was bought by the Louvre then. And then below is the Liberation St. Peter, which is now in St. Petersburg. But here is the Sult uh, Immaculate Conception. Um, auctioned in 52, it, it reached the, the top price of 615,000 francs, which was at the time one of the biggest uh, uh, payments may ever made for a painting. Um, and indeed, this is a kind of, of sort of painting that very much uh, um, uh, was admired and appealed uh, to collectors at the time. A painting that is here at the Wallace uh, of the Virgin Child with St. John the Baptist and, and St. Joseph in the background was indeed one of the pictures that the Maréchal Soult uh, took from the Cathedral of Seville, no less, 
Um, I'll show you in a minute the chapel it even came from. Uh, but it was one of these wonderful pictures where you have this sort of sacra conversazione, the sacred conversation between the Virgin, uh, the Christ child and, and the and, the, and St. John the Baptist, St. John the Baptist is, is, is showing the Virgin this little banderole on which is written Eke Agnus Dei, he is the Lamb of God, and of course, to the far right, you've got the Lamb of God itself. So, you know, it's, it's foreboding his, 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 his sacrifice, and yet it's a very appealing, family-like almost uh, um, image. But here is a chapel it came from, the Capilla Nueva in uh, Seville Cathedral. Um, we do know that the civilians uh, did hide most of their Murillos, and indeed our one was hidden, but Soult nevertheless found it. But one can imagine that our painting would have perhaps hung up high like these pictures here that are, are now in, in the chapel. Um, as you'll see in this lecture, I've made every uh, possible effort to, to try and find out where our pictures originally came from. And it is fascinating, and it's a way of traveling. I have to admit, I have missed my travels to Spain, and this has been the best, ne next best thing to be able to, to dip back into uh, the love I have for the Iberian Peninsula. But back to the Wallace, um, we do have a very uh, distinguished group of, of Murillos that were um, commissioned, interestingly enough, by a Genoese merchant who was living in uh, Cadiz, uh, had um, contacts with uh, Murillo and his studio, and a commissioned a series of paintings that he brought back to Genoa. Um, and then he eventually gave them to the Capuchin church in, in Genoa. And they were bought by a dealer and then eventually made it into the Wallace's collection. Um, they are very uh, special pictures. They, one of them shows the adoration of the shepherds, um, the ideal Christmas card, I have to say. Uh, but when you zoom in, there's this wonderful sort of feeling of of this sort of modesty, this the humility of the shepherds as they kneel down and pray before the Christ child. Uh, the Virgin again, very realistic and yet beautifully pure and, and, and sacred looking with her red and blue drapery. The Christ child who almost shines in, it, in himself, he's almost uh, illuminating the scene itself. And then you have wonderful details like this, this um, young lamb uh, at the bottom uh, that's been tied up um, so, you know, again, he's been able to, to combine reality with, with the sacred. And then when he needs to depict a, a more realistic scene, we have here St. Thomas of Villanueva, a saint from Valencia, giving alms to the poor. Um, he really is able to capture um, the sort of uh, the street life of, of Seville uh, to the extent that you, you, you can actually uh, look at the wounds of this poor beggar. He's suffering from eczema in the hair. Uh, and then the dirty feet, one of the great sort of paintings of, of dirt uh, that we have in the Wallace collection. There's very little dirt, I have to say, or representations, such realistic representations. But this one is, is one of the few that we have in the collection. And then the painting that the fourth mark was, was hesitant about by because he, um, I think, I mean, this is Joseph uh, being um, put into the well. And he's about to be sold off um, as a slave. Um, by his brothers. You can see on the right the, the multicolored the, the multi coat here. Um, but I think the Marcus probably didn't like this, this, this idea of this poor boy being, uh, being murdered, being thrown into the well, and, and maybe the expression of the young boy uh, perturbed him. We don't know. But we do know that he hesitated. And indeed, he, only, he, he says, I only like pleasing pictures. And the subject of the one in question may not be quite to my taste. Um, however, as you can see, um, he did buy it in the end. But it's interesting to think that uh, you know, Hartford liked pictures that weren't too um, sort of uh, engaged in a sort of sense of pain or, 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 or sort of uh, extreme in, in terms of, of emotion. But um, he did go for absolute gems. And this is one of my absolute favorites here at the Wallace, uh, Murillo's a marriage of the Virgin. It's, it's a small picture. It's about, uh, uh, about 40 centimeters high. Um, it's extremely delicately painted and it's in pristine condition. And one of the things I discovered while researching is that this painting originally came from the Royal Palace in Madrid, no less. It had been uh, given uh, or acquired by Charles III from his uh, um, surgeon uh, an Irishman of all, of all people called Florencio Kelly, Florence Kelly, and, um, and was taken uh, by 
uh, Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother, um, uh, when, he had, when he left Spain in, in 1812, and then eventually found itself in, in French collections before the Marquis uh, acquired it. Um, but when you zoom into this picture, the first thing that really um, sort of strikes you really is the, is the color scheme and the purity of the pigments that he's used. There's no doubt that he's used ultramarine blue, lapis lazuli for the blue drapery of, of the Virgin. Um, you then have this wonderful moment where the high priest bearded, um, you know, takes their vows and, and blesses them. You have St. Jo uh, Joseph holding the broken stick that flowered, that signified that he was to be the husband. Um, and then you've got the, those, the suitors, those who did not uh, get the hand of, of the Virgin and they're breaking the stick. So again, you've got these wonderful little details. But look at those greens against the purples and, and pinks. Uh, again, very, very uh, ambitious in terms of, of color scheme. The astonishing thing about this picture is that it's painted on mahogany, a very um, luxury wood that would have come from probably Cuba or from the Americas, would have probably come through the port of, the, of Seville, the Guadal, up the Guadalquivir River. Um, and it seems, and we do know that Murillo enjoyed painting small pictures on very special kinds of, of um, surfaces, either panel, stone, even obsidian and the volcanic stone. And in this case, it happens to be mahogany. And I presume he particularly liked the way the paint uh, would be, could be applied to this panel and, and bring out the sheer luxury uh, of, 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 the, of the surface texture. And here's the version again, um, that you can see looking down very humbly. And then behind, probably my favorite uh, painting, a uh, part of the painting, this woman in, with a, a lost profile uh, with a red ribbon. It's almost Velasquez-like in its finish. And again, this is very likely that uh, Murillo painted this after his trip to Madrid, where he did indeed have time to look at the great Velasquez and, and enjoy his, his way of using um, paint and, and dissolving it and then bringing it back together to create these very beautiful real scenes. Um, but also uh, at the Royce Collection, on the one hand, we've got that very beautiful Marriage of the Virgin, highly finished in, the, in its uh, um, approach for a very high-end patron. We do, still do not know who commissioned the Marriage of the Virgin. But next to it, we do have a very interesting and relatively rare oil sketch by Murillo, an oil sketch that has um, been of great interest to me because um, oil sketches are almost the, the closest you'll get to understanding uh, the, work, the, the artist in, in the process of thinking, his composition and editing and reworking. And this, when you get close to it, you will see it has many changes uh, beneath the surface. So what we have here is the Virgin Child enthroned in, in the skies. And then you've got four saints uh, below, St. Francis, uh, Santa Justa and Rufina, the patron saints of Seville kneeling at the bottom, and then St. John the Baptist. Um, it was uh, very likely linked, this sketch, to a very important commission that uh, Murillo received in the late 60s, 1660s, for the Capuchin uh, Monastery, uh, which still exists, amazingly, uh, today. Uh, but of course, the French stole all the paintings, even though they made it back eventually. Uh, but they're no longer in the church, uh, but now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Seville. Uh, I'm just showing you this very wonderful drawing by Richard Ford, the author of the handbook uh, for travelers to Spain, but also somebody who spent a lot of time in, in Seville. And this is a little drawing he made of the, um, uh, the, the walls of Seville, um, the, this little hermitage of San Gildo. But to the left, you can see uh, the Capuchin Monastery as it was in the uh, uh, early 19th century, which gives you an idea of, of, of how it's how it's changed since, but also how it would have looked at the time. And of course, the Capuchins wanted to always be on the outside of the city as they were um, mendicant friars uh, um, you know, with the vow of poverty. Uh, but going back to the sketch, um, it's very likely that this was the preparatory sketch for the main altarpiece of, of this um, friary. Um, I say this because we have a drawing that survives uh, that is now in a private collection in, in New York, uh, but that is very interesting because it shows you uh, St. Francis kneeling, the two saints, uh, Santa Augusta and Rufina kneeling, and St. John the Baptist, this time looking straight at us. But in between Augusta and Rufina is a very strange 
uh, almost sort of empire state building shape. And that, um, interestingly, when you look at the sketch uh, with that uh, knowledge in mind, you could start seeing that beneath the um, sort of um, uh, mist that rises behind the two uh, uh, ladies is what I think uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, this, this shape, which I know for sure is the Giralda, the uh, wonderful prayer tower that uh, belonged to the mosque of Seville that was turned by the Christians into a bell tower. Um, and uh, of course, the, the miracle of these two lady saints uh, is that they, uh, one day there was a terrible earthquake in Seville, the Giralda tower was about to collapse, but lo and behold, they both appeared, they flew up and they held it together and it did not fall. And it appears that Murillo wanted to have this Giralda in the middle, uh, but decided to rub it out because it got in the way by the, seat, the looks of it. The other, but the other interesting thing is that the, in the end for the, uh, this commission, he decided actually to extract these two ladies out of the sketch and turn them into a painting in, in itself. And indeed that's what happened. And this is the painting that is now in the Fine Arts Museum where you see the two saints holding up the, uh, the tower. Um, they were the, the, the daughters of a Roman potter and they refused uh, to uh, let the Romans use their pots in order to um, um, sort of venerate uh, um, Roman idols. And because of that, they were sent uh, to be um, killed by the lion in uh, the local Colosseum. So this is interesting in itself that the oil sketch should uh, be then reworked into a final picture. But it doesn't stop there. We then have the St. John the Baptist is also extracted from the sketch and turned into a separate altarpiece. So you have him here um, uh, St. John the Baptist this time looking upwards uh, from the right um, rather than from the left. And this is the discovery I made the other day, uh, uh, very early in the morning, I came in and, and had a good look at our picture. Then behind St. John the Baptist, if, and this might be difficult to see on your screens, but you will see uh, the, uh, what is the outline of a bishop's mitre. You will then see a face here. You'll see the nose here an open mouth, a beard, and you might even see a crozier. This is Saint Leander, who then makes it into a separate altarpiece again, uh, but this time he has a little um, angel holding up his mitre, so he's shown uh, bareheaded, but still holding his mitre. So it seems that the old sketch was, was, was sure the first sort of idea, but that he then decided to uh, extract these saints. He probably thought that it was too busy um, and indeed, very recently, uh, to celebrate Murillo's uh, anniversary, the civilians uh, made the wonderful attempt of recreating this altarpiece. Uh, this is a sort of a, a diagram they came up with. So you can see St. Augusta here, St. Leander here, St. John the Baptist, and sorry, St. Joseph uh, up here. And then the main altarpiece is a very different subject. This is what they did. Uh, they managed to borrow this wonderful painting from Cologne, where it is now. Um, and it shows St. Francis on his own, um, having this vision of the, um, um, the moment when Christ and the Virgin appear and give him all these wonderful roses and tell, it, tell him that on this site, if you build a church, you will receive um, the indulgence um, of less time in, in, in hell and, um, and make and build a church on top. And it's known as the chapel of the Porciuncula. Um, so this is what happens eventually. Um, and indeed they restored it. And it's quite interesting to compare the initial idea and the final um, composition. And you can still see that he's kept the sort of heavenly apparition, uh, but this time introduced uh, the Christ inside uh, the picture. So for me, this is a very important uh, oil sketch that shows Murillo in the act of, of working things out. Uh, and it's here at the Wallace for you to come and admire next time. But also at the Wallace is, uh, the only painting uh, by the great Spanish artist Alonso Cano in the UK. There are no other collections that have uh, a very important painting by him. Uh, he was particularly famous in the 19th century as, and was hailed as a Spanish Michelangelo because he was not only a painter, but a sculptor and architect. Um, and the painting in question is this rather interesting early work by him of St. John the Evangelist and being uh, sort of calmed down. He's having his, his visions. This is the apocalypse. Uh, the angel appears to him to 
to sort of make him relax in his visions. But the vision he's having is the moment when the uh, um, Temple of Jerusalem uh, appears above um, and he's in, in complete ecstasy. Uh, indeed, uh, when you go and look at the temple from close by, I'll, I'll come back to this, but uh, here it is. Um, uh, the, the way that it's uh, described in the apocalypse, and it says, an angel carried John to a mountain, uh, mountaintop, and showed him the new Jerusalem um, coming down out of heaven. It was built on the, as a square with high walls and 12 gates, um, at each of which was an angel. Um, it was made of jewels and gold, and the river of the water of, the, of life flowed through it. So this is this vision that he is having. Um, and it's a very, a very central painting, the way not only the angel that appears that has this very feminine quality uh, to it, but also the way the skin is painted, the way the light falls across it. Um, it's one of the most beautiful pictures, I think, that uh, Carno ever painted. Also the expression of, of St. John, of the open mouth. It's, he's, he does look like a real person that's been used uh, to depict him. Um, and then you go to these wonderful drapery studies, uh, the way the greens are, are almost sort of shiver in the air. Uh, there's a very strong volume and, 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 and sculptural quality. And then this foot, again, a very beautifully modeled foot. Uh, you know, he, uh, Carno did draw a lot. He, he was an academic artist to a certain extent. And, and this is proof uh, from my point of view uh, in this uh, great artistic uh, achievement. But um, this, this little painting, again, it's um, about 50 centimeters high, came from a convent, the convent of Santa Paula, one of the great sort of jewels of Seville that not many people know about, but that is open to the public. And in it is an altarpiece, uh, which unfortunately uh, most of the, well, all the paintings by Carnot were stolen by Sult yet again um, in the Peninsula War. And so now you have the sculptures that were are original to it, but all the little um, paintings are, are later sort of additions. And this is what it could have looked like um, before Soult got his hands on the pictures with all the other little pictures, which are now uh, in the Louvre and in America of all places. The sculpture in the middle is uh, by the great sculptor Montagnès, the god of wood carving, as he was known. Um, and indeed, uh, it's highly likely that Carno studied with him as a sculptor. So there would have been a good sort of uh, uh, collaborative um, uh, endeavor here. Uh, and indeed, I think the sculptural quality of Montaigne's work would have inspired um, um, Carnot to bring out the sort of three-dimensional quality in his paintings. These are the other two of St. John having a vision of God on the left and the vision of the Lamb on the right. They're both in the Ringling Museum in Sarasota. Um, and then uh, the St. John the Evangelist with the poison chalice um, luckily, he, he was going to be poisoned, but he, he saw uh, that there was a, a sort of serpent in it and did not drink it. And then St. James as, as a pilgrim, uh, both in the Louvre today. Um, but as I said, it's the, the angel, the quality and the, the freshness of this painting that makes it a, a true um, jewel-like masterpiece. And then the other painter that we have, of course, in our collection, is Diego Velasquez, uh, as, as he was known by Manet when he um, sort of discovered him to a certain extent, one uh, through a copy in the Louvre, but then through by going to Madrid in the 1860s and came back saying that he was the painter of painters. Um, and we have a very interesting selection. They tend to be portraits, it has to be said, uh, but portraits of the Spanish royal family. And here we have uh, the prince, Don Baltazar Carlos, uh, uh, the, the Philip the Second, uh, Philip the Fourth's um, uh, heir apparent at the time, with his queen Isabel de Valois, who was French. Uh, he was born in 1629. Uh, interestingly, while Velasquez was on his first trip to Italy, and he he was actually ordered to return from Italy in order to uh, start painting portraits of of the future king of Spain. And this is one of his second portraits, as you'll see, of of the of Balthazar Carlos. Um, a wonderful sort of uh, uh, display of being able to capture this, this youth and this innocence, and yet this young boy who's, who's been asked already to, to act up, to pose as a captain general. He's wearing the red sash of a, of a military commander, 
and, and the, the baton of, of command as well. Um, interestingly, uh, this is something I, that uh, I found out, the, the painting that's now at the Wallace was in the Altim, Altim, uh, Altamira collection in the 18th century, the Count of Altamira, and they are the ones who commissioned this wonderful uh, little red boy, Manuel de Osorio, and one would imagine that Goya, who painted this, uh, would have been quite familiar with the Velázquez that he would have seen in, in the collection in Madrid. And it's interesting to, to be able to compare uh, what an 18th century artist does with, with uh, the 17th century Velázquez in terms of depicting uh, youth and, and the boy who's of similar age, around uh, four years old. Um, but when you zoom into uh, our wonderful portrait, there's something very engaging in, in the face, the way the hair has been ruffled, uh, he hasn't been properly combed, and yet you have this very serious attire, you even got the gorget, uh, a sort of metal um, um, protection around his throat, and then this beautiful red sash below. Um, he's holding the hilt of his sword, uh, he's you know, in, in, in command as such, uh, and then when you approach it, you have this wonderful sort of impressionistic quality, it's almost a sort of Monet scene of a winter scene of snow falling on on the landscape um, and uh, it's 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 got this incredible sort of uh, uh, technique which Velasquez knew that when you get close it breaks up as soon as you take a step back it comes together again and looks as if it's real. Um, our picture comes after um, a very celebrated painting which is now in Boston in the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, it shows again the prints much younger uh, posing in a very similar way with um, uh, his um, uh, sort of dwarf, court dwarf, attempting to mimic him um, as, as, as the prince stands in, 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 in a very elegant pose. And it seems that ours is very close to that, except this time the hat has been moved to the left, but it comes in that sort of sequence. And what is fascinating about Velasquez and his relationship with the prince is that he was to depict him as he grew up. He was to become his sort of official court artist and portray him um, as he uh, engaged more and more into the, um, the responsibilities at court and the training uh, as the future king of Spain. This uh, indeed is uh, the type of picture that came out from Velázquez's studio. It's not by Velázquez, but uh, very likely to have been authorized by Velázquez. Um, the, again, the young prince holding a a flintlock gun um, with a landscape behind, so he was trained already in the art of hunting. Um, then you have him uh, hunting for, for sport uh, here, and this is indeed by Velasquez, one of the wonderful portraits of, of the young prince uh, with his two dogs standing. It would have been a, a, accompanied with a portrait of his father and his uncle, uh, also in hunting attire. So it shows you know, that he's already been trained up as such. Um, and then for more official uh, uh, commissions, uh, for official special spaces, um, um, little Bartolo Carlos was made to pose on, on this little uh, sort of pony horse. Um, and this indeed was to accompany his own father on horseback and decorate the celebrated Hall of Realms, the, the Salon de los Reinos, which uh, was one of the sort of center spaces in the famous palace of the Buen Retiro which uh, Philip IV had instructed the Count Duke of Olivares, his prime minister, uh, to build and to, and to decorate and to uh, be used as a space to entertain, but also impress uh, foreign diplomats. And you can see in the distance how these pictures would have uh, been um, uh, installed. Indeed, this is a reconstruction that the Prado made about uh, 15 years ago. But you can see that Baltazar Carlos was on top of the doorway while his uh, father and mother were on the side. Uh, but again, you can see that there's all part of the propaganda at the time um, in order to push uh, the prince forwards as, as the next in line. But at the Wallace, back at the Wallace, we do have this very interesting, intriguing, perhaps even enigmatic portrait of Balthazar Collins. He's on the horseback, he's doing a levade. He's obviously being trained um, in horsemanship behind is uh, part of the Buen Retiro Palace. It happens to be uh, the prince's uh, private quarters. Um, and when you get closer, you can see he's again wearing this the red sash of, of, the, of, the, of the command, the command the commander. He's wearing his beautifully sort of feathered hat. He's in total control as he looks out at you. 
Um, and then interestingly uh, behind is a, a scene that we have uh, been working on recently. We've just restored this, this painting. Um, but you can see that there's a man standing here, a young boy or perhaps even a dwarf is presenting him with what looks like a lance. And indeed behind is what appears to be a tilting yard. Um, it looks as if the uh, young prince is being taught how to tilt. This is part of his training as a sort of Christian military leader as such. And uh, it, it seems, and it's very likely that um, um, he's gonna be tilting a, um, or riding at the rings, which was a form of jousting at the time in which the, the horseman rides at full gallop and inserts uh, his, his lance through uh, small rings that would have been uh, hanging. Um, so this is a skill that um, uh, would have been, he would have been instructed to, to do. And then there's this very strange sort of uh, contraption at the back. Uh, we all wonder what this is. Is it with wheels? Is it something that uh, could be used in, for training so that he could train with the lance um, without the horse so that he wouldn't fall off? And indeed, we know that the Count Duke Olivares, who saw himself as the man responsible for training him, um, would sometimes run along as to make sure that the prince wouldn't fall off his horse so that he could actually catch him. Um, but here's the uh, more better detail of the tilting yard, again, very sketched. Um, and this it's a painting that's been questioned. Is it by Velasquez? Is it Velasquez and his studio? Uh, this is something that we're, we're looking into at this very moment. But uh, what, what's for sure is that it is so sketched like that one imagined this is a sort of first idea for a picture. And then on the far left, is this little uh, um, sort of uh, depiction of a, of a dwarf, of a court dwarf. We wonder who he is. He might be El Primo, um, who was a dwarf that was given to uh, Bartolo Carlos in 1643, uh, which might be a bit too late for the date of the painting, so it might not actually be him. But we do know that El Primo was uh, Bartolo Carlos' personal dwarf and was there to, to keep him company and, and, uh, and make life a bit lighter within the very strict Spanish etiquette uh, of the court. Um, but there is, the reason I said it's a very interesting and enigmatic picture is because the Wallace painting is connected to a very beautiful uh, second version, which is now in a private collection in the UK. And um, the, the, the connection is so close one wonders whether they were painted at the same time in the, in the same sort of studio space, or whether the Wallace is a copy of the one that's in the private collection or vice versa. Um, we don't know. And this is something that we, we will be exploring um, in a, a special sort of public study day uh, next year. So do look out on our website. But what's interesting is that uh, there is for sure uh, differences. Um, and it's the perfect spot, the difference. Uh, the horse and the Horsemen are pretty much the same, although interestingly, uh, there's um, Balsar Carlos at the Wallace has a bit longer hair. <coughs> Is he meant to look a bit older than he did in this picture? Again, a question mark. But the main thing that is different is the scene that's going on in the lower right hand corner. Um, and indeed, uh, we do know who these men are, they are recognizable. Uh, this is the Count Duke Olivares. Prime Minister to Philip IV and, and favorite, um, somebody who was in power from 1623 uh, to, uh, to 1643, um, extremely uh, uh, powerful and ambitious and saw it as his personal responsibility to train the young prince. Uh, he's uh, known to have said, you know, extraordinary sort of quotes that I found. God, he said, God is Spanish and fights for our nation these days. So he, he did come up with the kind of tweets we have all heard about recently. Um, but he was a very impressive character. And here he is receiving uh, the lance from the keeper of arms, uh, Alonso Martinez de Lispinar. Um, so he's been handing over the lance uh, by this man in the middle. And then in the background, we have Juan Mateos, who was the king's master of the hunt. So we have very key people here who are, are very, um, keen to, to be present in the training of the young prince. And then in the background, <coughs> sorry, no less, we have Philip IV, his wife Isabel II, and possibly their daughter, Maria Antonia. And then some people have suggested that the lady here might be uh, the Duchess of Olivares, the Duke, the Count Duke's wife. So 
one could say that the iconography, the, the subject matter here really is much more political, more there's more propaganda going on. Well, the Wallace painting is perhaps more about uh, the art of jousting, but that's uh, something that we will be looking into. What's fascinating, of course, is the backdrop. Um, and in true Velasquez style, he's keen and very uh, wants to sort of record the place where this happened. There's a sense of him wanting to, to almost record it like a visual diary. And we do know that because of the roof, these are the private departments of the, of the prince. So here's a wonderful general view of the Buen Retiro Palace, which is today the Retiro Park. The Prado is around here in the lower corner here. The Church of Los Geronimos still is there, and that's the entrance to it. But the apartments of the prince was uh, to the far right. You can just see the tiled roof here, uh, which appears behind Velasquez's painting. And actually, here is a, a sort of bird's eye view. And what the area we're looking at is this tower here. So the prince is just in front of it here um, in, in what was the um, Jardín del Príncipe and the, and the uh, quarter of the, of the prince. Um, and I, I luckily found this very interesting print by a Frenchman who visited Madrid in the 1680s. And here you get a fantastic view of the uh, corner of the of the of the, uh, of the, uh, prince, uh, the prince's quarters. So you've got the same roof here. So you can imagine Velasquez painting just behind the plinth here with the, the background here. Um, the, the horse that we see up here is a very interesting sculpture. Uh, that was commissioned from the famous um, Italian um, sculptor called Pietro Tacca, uh, who uh, was commissioned to, uh, to do an equestrian sculpture in bronze of Philip IV. And it was commissioned as early as 1634, but it wasn't delivered until 1642. But the interesting thing, it was installed right in this courtyard. Um, and one, and I, again, I found this other very interesting painting where you can see it here to the left, and this is the area where um, Baltar Carlos is posing on his horseback. And one would like to think, although the date of our picture is yet to be defined, it's been dated between 1637 and 1640, should we push a bit forwards when this sculpture arrived and was installed? But there is a wonderful connection between the young man trying to emulate his, his father um, as he uh, is being trained to become the next king. So again, these are the questions we will be exploring uh, later and uh, next year. Uh, so please do join us for that. The other wonderful picture portrait we have a masterpiece in itself is the um, portrait of, of the lady with the fan. Um, uh, we don't know who she is, she's anonymous, and yet she is one of the most enticing uh, portraits there is um, in, in, in this collection. She, she looks at us very, uh, Tentatively, she's, her eyes are moist as if she's just blinked and opened her eyes again. Um, there's this wonderful sort of uh, depiction of her cleavage with this brushwork working around it. A wonderful fan as it's been flicked open. You can see that he's played with the, um, um, the, the sort of size of the fan, but he's decided to make it a bit shorter. Uh, the gloves themselves are painted with, with great uh, precision. And then this wonderful detail of what might be her rosary that's tied up with this beautiful uh, bluish ribbon. And then probably um, um, one wonders what that stone is, but it could be red coral, which we know uh, was used by the Spanish to ward off um, uh, evil. But there's been great debate as to who she might be, this lady, this anonymous lady. And a few years ago, um, Dr. Zaira Veliv came up with a very interesting uh, proposal that she's actually a French lady um, who was known as the Duchesse de Chevreuse who had come to Spain in 1637, 1638. Um, she had to flee the French court because she'd uh, been in, involved in all kinds of conspiracies against Richelieu and, and Louis XIII. And she sought refuge at the Spanish court, probably with Isabelle de Valois. Um, and these are all the portraits of her that survive. And you can see that she looks rather different than pretty much every single one of them. And of course, one wonders, does she, does she actually look like the, the wonderful painting that we have here at the Wallace? Um, there is, however, I mean, and again, I don't know. I don't know the answer yet. I'm not fully convinced, but there is this wonderful print of, of her with the title beneath. So, you know, prints do not lie. And interestingly, when you flick it round um, and then juxtapose it 
with our painting, there might be something that, that could, could be said that she might be French. Um, Zahir, I believe, did a great study on, on the clothing that she wore, that these are a kind of clothing that was not worn by Spanish ladies at court, but more likely by, by French ladies. She was a woman of great fashion, so that might explain um, why and who she is. Um, the, the, uh, the, the enigma, the, the mystery continues uh, with the fact that in Chatsworth, in the central of England, there is another picture of, I think, the very much the same lady. And again, um, the attribution of this picture has been questioned. Is it Velasquez? Is it by Velasquez's son-in-law, who was a very good painter, somebody called Del Mazo? Um, I think it's a highly, um, you know, highly accomplished work, and I would love to see it being restored one day. But seeing the two together, um, you can tell that they, they for sure were the same lady posing for Velasquez. So she must have been of, of great importance to Velasquez, who did not paint that many uh, people outside uh, the court itself. So something to, again, to be worked out in future. But um, still with Velasquez, um, when he was in Rome, and he has a wonderful view of the Trinita de Monte and the Spanish, well, before the Spanish steps were installed by Bonini, um, Velasquez returned to Rome in 1650, and he was there um, to paint. Well, he was actually sent, first of all, to, to buy uh, works of art for the king and to find Italian artists to decorate the ceilings of the royal palaces in Madrid. But he did paint, um, and we all know the wonderful Innocent X. We know the Rukvi Venus, which is now the Nashgen, and of course, the, the wonderful uh, Juan de Pareja, his, his personal slave. So he did uh, make some wonderful uh, masterpieces while he was there. But he did commission a works of art from local artists. And um, some of these were bronze sculptures from the great um, sculptor Alessandro Algardi. And the Wallace, surprisingly, me, has uh, versions of these sculptures that were commissioned and, and sent back to Spain. Um, they show on the left uh, Jupiter, uh, um, sort of over the Titans, controlling the Titans, and then we saw, see Juno with uh, the winds beneath her. And they were commissioned by Velasquez to, be, uh, to, um, to, to, to become fire dogs for the fireplace at the Royal Palace in Madrid. This is a reconstruction at the Met of another version of, of these bronzes, but this is how they would have looked in front of a fireplace. It seems that Philip IV, although he liked them very much, preferred to put them outside on, um, on, on his fountains in his palace outside Madrid in Aranjuez. And here is an early uh, drawing by an English ambassador, actually, or an English uh, traveler to Spain, who depicts uh, Algardi's sculptures. And the king was so keen that he commissioned the two others uh, to decorate um, the, this fountain. And, and it was one of the most famous uh, so fountain sculptures in, in Arajuez at the time. Um, and indeed, they were still there until the, the sort of late 19th century. Here you see them uh, on the, in, the, in, the, um, in the park of Arajuez on the fountains. And unfortunately, uh, they were stolen during the Second World War. So here is the original by uh, Algardi in Arajuez. And here is the version that was made very soon after from Algardi's um, workshop. Uh, for, interestingly, the French court, very likely the Cardinal Mazarin. It then went into the uh, French royal collection. Um, and we know that because there is an inventory number on our bronze sculptures. So although they're not directly related to Velasquez, they, were, they would have been inspired by Velasquez's uh, original commission. So that's, again, a very nice link that the Wallace has with Velasquez as the collector as such. Also, uh, and, and this is the, the fountain, unfortunately, today without <laughs> the, the two sculptures that were, were stolen. Um, but also at the Wallace, you will all know that we have one of the greatest arms and armor collections, but also, and this is something that not many people realize, some of the most extraordinary guns, particularly, particularly flintlock mechanisms in, 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 in the world. And they are, they are German guns, they're French guns, they're Spanish guns, but uh, here I'm showing you two very important guns made uh, by one of the most famous gun makers uh, in working in Versailles, somebody called Boutet. And the reason I'm showing you these because, is because they belonged to Charles IV, uh, King of Spain in the early 1800s. 
And to the extent that he is <clears throat> here represented by my favorite artist, Goya of King Charles IV in his hunting attire with one of his guns. Now, I'm not saying that the gun he's holding is the one that uh, we have here, the warriors, but we do know he was a, a, an avid um, uh, shot, uh, that he commissioned his, his best guns uh, from Paris and indeed was given guns by Napoleon, no less, as a special diplomatic present. Um, and these guns, the proof that I have is that we have still the royal sort of monogram on, on, the, on the hilt of the gun, um, but also the way that they're decorated. You could see that you've got the hunting dogs here, you've got these beautiful decorations along the flink lock mechanism here. Um, they're astonishing quality. And you've even got, the, they're even signed, Boutet, Directeur, Artiste, Manufacture, à Versailles. So um, they are uh, truly exceptional in their, in their quality. Um, but what's fascinating is that we, not, we have two pairs and the other pair originally belonged to Charles IV, but were appropriated by Joseph Bonaparte when he took over the Spanish throne in 1808. And he took his coat of arms and put them on top of Charles IV's uh, monogram. Um, so again, this very interesting appropriation of, of not only works of art paintings, but in this case of, of guns. Um, as you can imagine, Joseph Bonaparte was not popular with the Spanish uh, to the extent that uh, he was uh, uh, caricatured as a complete drunkard. Um, he was known as Pepe Botella, um, uh, Pepe the Bottle Man. Uh, and here is a caricature of him um, drink, uh, you know, completely, uh, well, praying by the looks of it in a bottle uh, while these angels appear with, with grapes. Um, and he says, Cada cual tiene su suerte, everybody who has his luck and yours. Uh, is, is to be a drunkard until, until death. So um, again, this, the, the fact that with these guns, you can you know, go back to uh, Goya, but also Joseph Bonaparte makes the Boris a very special place. And even in the, our shop, we have uh, extraordinary paintings that uh, have yet to be studied. And I'm, I'm gonna end here really, but um, in the shop just above the books is this painting, uh, a copy by Murillo. It's always been thought to be a 19th century copy. It's extremely dirty. It needs a good uh, clean. And the original, the, the one that we know is, is beautifully by Murillo, is in the Prado. And it looks like this. Uh, but imagine if we cleaned out. And again, you know, this, this sounds a bit like uh, Philip Mould, fake and fortune talking here. But imagine if we cleaned ours and we came up with a new Murillo to add to the list. Thank you very much uh, for, this, for listening this evening. Um, a quick plug, as you can imagine, we're going through very difficult moments at the moment. So any support you can give us uh, by you know, getting your Christmas cards here at the Wallace, please do so. Uh, we'd be very, very grateful. Um, and also we do a lot of online courses. So we've really been able to uh, expand our ability to, to use the di digital format to, to really make the Wallace come to your home. So do stay in touch, uh, sign up uh, for our newsletter and, and do take part in all the courses that we have and anything that we do from a teaching point of view. But thank you very much for listening and I'll be delighted uh, to take any questions that you might have uh, this evening. So Xavi, thank you so much for that really enlightening journey through some of the Spanish paintings at the Wallace Collection. We've actually had quite a few questions come through, so I'm just going to read these out to you. Um, do you think Alonso Cano is underrated? <laughs> I do, I do. I think uh, Alonso Cano, I think um, because he was a great sculptor, painter and architect, um, he probably attracts people who specialize in those arts, but never he's never been sort of looked at as a whole. And I think it is about time that, um, you know, I mean, they have done exhibitions on him in Spain, but um, he's never been uh, considered um, um, outside Spain. And I think um, he does deserve to be um, sort of uh, reconsidered as one of the, the greats of Spanish art alongside Cerberan, Murillo Velasquez. There's no doubt about that. And um, just on that, what was the name of the sculptor who inspired Cano? Uh, Juan, Mar Juan Martinez Montañez. Um, was um, the great sculptor of Seville at the time. And um, it is traditionally said that uh, Carnot studied with him. 
Uh, but we do know that Montaigne has collaborated a lot with, with local artists, particularly um, Pacheco, who was Velasquez's father-in-law and teacher. Um, so it was a small group of, of artists for sure. And Carno uh, was very proud to have passed his exams, uh, artist exams, and was a member of the Guild of St. Luke, like Velasquez and like um, Pacheco. But he was, he was interestingly very against Serbran. When Serbran came to Seville without his diploma, so uh, Karno was the one that sort of made a real fuss about it, that he shouldn't be allowed to paint. So while Karno was probably, <laughs> you know, a good painter, well, he's probably quite sort of, you know, very keen on his academic training and, and following a very rigorous um, rules um, in terms of protecting, I suppose, his, his art and his commissions. Thank you. And um, could you just recall the author of the bird's eye view of the palace that you showed us? So if I remember correctly, it is a Spanish um, artist and I can't remember his full name. I, I could find it somewhere, but um, I think Nunez is something. Um, but he, yeah, he, he recorded in the 1650s uh, views of the Royal Palace in print for, for publications. And um, I'm sure this next question could be the subject of an entire talk, but do you think Velasquez was re revolutionary in his portrait? In his portraits? Yes. He was. Um, he was, um, when you compare his early portraits of the king with the kind of portrait that were being painted at the Spanish royal court, which were very wooden, very, you know, very stiff and, and, and traditional, with very little character. They were more about the pose and what they were wearing than the sort of psychology of the sitter. Uh, for sure, Velasquez was able to introduce a completely novel way of, of painting, painting a person, a character in the most humane of ways. And this indeed was what was gonna instruct people like Goya later on, this ability to, to almost um, uh, inhabit the space of the sitter and let you sh share that with you as the viewer. That's something he does. He breaks those boundaries and makes you, makes everything very direct and, and present. He paints in the present and that's why the Balthazar on, um, on horseback that we have here at the Wallace is, is a fascinating picture because it's the kind of picture you'd, you'd imagine Manet painting later on, this sort of attempt to, to paint real life in a real place in almost real time, with, of course, artistic uh, edits along the way. Okay. And uh, probably our final question of the evening as we approach eight o'clock. Were there many 17th century women painters in Spain? And are there any in the Wallace collection? <laughs> um, there were very few women painters in Spain, uh, but that doesn't mean that there weren't any. And I think that's, again, you know, this is something that art history needs to correct. I do know that there was a very famous uh, Portuguese uh, woman painter, Josefa de Obidoix, who did fantastic still lives in the sort of Serbran style. Um, I, I sometimes wonder if part of um, Velasquez and his studio and his son-in-law whether some of their feminine uh, sort of uh, uh, relatives were involved in the workshop sometimes. Uh, one doesn't know, but it's possible uh, that, um, that um, you know, the fact that Velasquez married the daughter of Pacheco, why did the daughter not paint? And um, I'm sure she did, but it's just never been uh, uh, catalogued that way. So um, I think we need to have a, a, apply a mar much more open mind, and I think uh, and, and using the archives and doing our best to to try and decipher who might have been a, a, a woman painter at the time. Uh, but at the moment, there are none that come to mind except for that Portuguese lady. But I, I will think about it, and if I can, I'll get back to you. Brilliant. Well, again, that that draws our evening to a close. Zavi, thank you so much for um, your time this evening for taking us through that journey of Spanish painting and we look forward to, to having you back soon. Um, to our viewers this evening, thank you for joining us. As Xavi pointed out, we're very much relying upon um, the revenue we can generate through this type of activity. So please do head over to our website, www.twellescollection.org slash what's on, and you can find details of forthcoming talks and courses there. So good evening. Thank you very much.